very much, Professor Gamira, for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I know that's a long day, and uh, at the end of the day, we have uh, two, two interesting presentations. I'm going to start by ischemia, and the Professor Sama Shaheen is going to present another late uh, breaking clinical trials. So, uh, in a couple of minutes, uh, I'm going to uh, cover a very important trial. Uh, it's a landmark trial, and all cardiologists uh, all over the world are talking about this trial. Is this trial, will it change the practice or not? Uh, we don't know. And a lot of debates between intervention cardiologists and clinical cardiologists, whether there is a benefit of uh, doing uh, intervention, revascularization, PCI, or PAPA surgery in patients with stable angina versus conservative treatment alone, we will see the results, we will see the recommendations or the interpretation of uh, the, this important trial. We have to start by a background. This is a very important uh, slide, which differentiates between patients who have a stable angina, patients who have uh, a plaque which is characterized by, uh, characterized by uh, no excess lipid pool, uh, a lot of fibrosis and calcium. So this stable plaque uh, will be responsible for symptoms in the form of exertional angina, which can be detected by uh, exercise tolerance tests or imaging techniques. And the mainstay for treatment is anti-angina treatment and revascularization is recommended uh, in some cases. On the other hand, vulnerable plaque is completely different, even in the presence of minor obstruction, because there is an excess lipid pool, a thin fibrous cap, uh, and this uh, plaques are liable for rupture, causing acute coronary syndrome in the form of uh, ST elevation MI, non STEMI, unstable angina, or sudden death. So the management the approach is completely different. Pharmacologic stabilization is very important, and early identification of high risk patients and primary PCI for STEMI is uh, highly indicated. So what are the evidence from previous trials in management of patients with, with a stable angina? We have uh, three important trials. We have the COURAGE, PARI 2D, and the FAM2 trial. If we look back for a COURAGE trial, which randomized uh, around 3,000 patients who have a stable ischemic heart disease uh, for either PCI with optimal medical treatment or optimal medical treatment alone, looking for a primary endpoint, which was death or myocardial infarction. And interestingly, in this study, they did not demonstrate the benefit of PCI plus optimal medical treatment compared with optimal medical treatment. So this is the first study which proved that patients with stable angina should be treated medically. Then we came to diabetic patients. Barry 2D trial, which randomized around 2,300 patients. The same purpose to look for the outcome, revascularization versus medical treatment looking for a primary endpoint which was all-cause death. And interestingly, again, that uh, patients who were randomized for uh, revascularization, revascularization did not improve survival in diabetic patients with stable angina. And uh, FFR guided the PCI in the FAM2 trial were uh, around 8,000 patients randomized to FFR-guided PCI plus optimal medical treatment or medical treatment alone, and the primary endpoint was death, MI, MI or urgent revascularization, and in this study, uh, they proved that uh, the outcome in terms of all cause death, MI or urgent revascularization was better with PCI plus medical treatment compared with medical treatment alone. However, we have some important limitations for these three trials. One, low risk patients included in these trials. Two, revascularization procedures not optimal in courage and barry 2 trial. We don't have at the time uh, new generation drug eluting stance, no FFR. Third point is the referral bias. Those patients randomized after knowing the coronary anatomy. In comparison to ischemia trial, patients randomized after doing CT angiography. And finally, small sample size in some trials like FAM2 trial. So a fundamental question is important. If clinical trials in the optimal medical treatment era show no clear death or MI benefits, 
from an initial strategy of revascularization. So do we need to cast patients prior to a trial of optimal medical treatment? This is a very important question. And this is the ischemia research question. Any stable patients with at least moderate ischemia on a stress test or imaging, is there a benefit to add cardiac catheterization and if feasible, revascularization to optimal medical therapy? This is the question, which is an international study of comparative health effectiveness with medical and invasive approaches. Schema trial, which is, this is a primary report for the clinical outcomes, which was presented at the HA two weeks ago by Professor Judith Hockman, the main PI of the study. And we are proud to be part of this study because in Egypt, the cardiology department at Cairo University participated in this study. So look for the study design. Stable patients with evidence of moderate or severe ischemia, determined by sight, and then interpreted by the core lab. If the patient is eligible, blinded CT and geography was done to rule out life-threatening left main disease. If the anatomy is eligible, then randomization will start. To randomize patients to the invasive strategy plus optimal medical treatment, doing catheterization, optimal revascularization, PCR or cabbage, or a conservative strategy, optimal medical treatment alone, and the cardiac catheterization reserved only for optimal medical treatment failure. CT angiography was not performed in the GFR less than 30 or coronary anatomy previously defined. The primary endpoint is uh, time to cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, or resuscitated cardiac arrest. And the major secondary endpoints, cardiovascular death or MI, and quality of life. Other endpoints included orcos mortality, net clinical benefit, adding stroke to the components of the primary endpoint, and the components of uh, primary endpoint separately. And this slide summarizes the statistical strategy for this important study, which included 5,179 patients. The power considered more than 80% power to detect 18.5 relative reduction in primary endpoint, assuming an aggregate for inclusion and exclusion criteria. And this is a very important because patients were was considered eligible to be included in the study if he has a moderate or severe ischemia, defined by nuclear imaging, more than 10% of LV ischemia, dobutamine stress echo, more than three segments, stress induced, the moderate or severe hypokinesis or akinesis, CMR perfusion, more than 12% myocardial ischemia, or wall motion abnormalities, more than three segments of stress induced, uh, severe hypokinesis or akinesis, exercise tolerance test, if it is positive in the form of more than 1.5 millimeter astigmatic depression in two leads or more, or more than two millimeter astigmatic depression in single lead, achieving less than seven meds with angina. The major exclusion criteria, patients with MIA function class three to four heart failure, ejection fraction less than 35%, unacceptable angina despite medical therapy, acute coronary syndrome within two months, PCI or cabbage within one year, GFR less than 30 milli per minute, or on dialysis shifted to ischemia CKD study. CT angiography, the inclusion criteria, more than 50% stenosis in a major epicardial vessel in the presence of stress imaging per, uh, perfusion defects, or 70% or more stenosis in a proximal or med vessel in patients who have a positive exercise tolerance test. The major exclusion criteria, life-threatening left main disease defined by 50% or more left main narrowing. This is the endpoints definition for cardiovascular death, MI, unstable angina, heart failure, resuscitated cardiac arrest, and uh, the difference between spontaneous MI type 1, 2, 4, P or 4, C, or procedure MI, which is defined here in this slide, PCI-related myocardial infarction type 4A was defined as 
positive markers, CKMB, more than five times upper limit of normal, or troponin more than 35 upper limit of normal when CKMP is unavailable, plus at least one of the following, new ECG changes in the form of ST elevation or depression, more than one millimeter, new pathological Q waves in more than two contiguous leads, or new persistent left band branch block, and geography in the form of reduced flow in a major coronary artery. If we don't have this criteria, the elevation of CKMP more than tenfold upper limit of normal, or troponin more than 70-fold, uh, the MI decision, according to the site, was defined. On the other hand, cabbage-related myocardial infarction, which is type 5, according to the universal definition of MI, the CKMP level should be more than 10 upper limit of normal, troponin more than 70 upper limit of normal, plus at least one of the following, imaging positive, new ECG changes, or stand-alone biomarker definition, CKMP more than 15-fold, troponin more than 100-fold. Again, the endpoints definition for unstable angina, it's a prolonged ischemic symptoms at rest, or accelerating pattern resulting in hospitalization, new or worsening ST or TUV changes, and geographic evidence of rupture, the plaque. Heart failure necessitating hospitalization more than 24 hours, resuscitated cardiac arrest out of hospital or ER. So, look for the study flow. 8,500 patients were enrolled in the study. However, 3,000 patients were excluded. Why? Because the presence of insufficient ischemia in 1,350, the absence of obstructive coronary artery disease, 1,200, the presence of unprotected left main, which was in 5% of the 8,000 patients. So, they randomized 5,000. 179 patients, and CT coronary angiography was performed in 73% of the randomized patients. If you look for the invasive strategy, which included 2,500 patients, the median follow-up was 3.3 years, and the follow-up completed up to 99.5%, which is excellent follow-up. On the other hand, the randomized patients to conservative strategy, 2,500 patients, and the same median follow-up as well as uh, the follow-up was 99%. Look for this slide, which is summarized the baseline clinical characteristics of patients included in the study. The median age, 64. Female gender represent 23%. Diabetic patients, 42%. The median ejection fraction was uh, 60%. The LDL cholesterol, 83 milligram per deciliter. History of angina in... 90% of patients. And uh, the stress test modality used in this trial, stress imaging in 75% and 25% were sub subjected to exercise tolerance test. The core lab interpretation for ischemia, severe ischemia was identified in around 54%, moderate ischemia, 33%, mild or non-ischemia, in 12%. Look for the anatomy by CT and geography. The number of vessels invasive versus conservative strategy, defined as vessels with more than 50% stenosis, single vessel, two vessel disease, and the three vessel disease in 47% of patients included in the study. And then if you look for the uh, LED in 87%, proximal LED 46 or 47%, and circumflex 68 right coronary artery in 70%. Risk factor management, comparing the baseline versus the last visit, if we look uh, for the baseline average, last visit average for the use of any statins, for high intensity statins, and for the use of ACE inhibitor or ARPs. And the, this slide is very important because uh, it uh, focuses on the high level of medical therapy optimization, which is defined as an LDL level less than 70 mg per deciliter, a systolic blood pressure less than 140 mm mercury, the use of antiplatelets or anticoagulants, and no smoking. High level of medical therapy optimization is missing if any of the individual goals are missing. So this summarizes the LDL level at baseline and at the last visit, 
in patients subjected to this study. Comparing the use of medications, we can see that uh, the use of beta blockers uh, was uh, more or less the same with conservative as well as invasive strategy. The use of calcium ch channel blocker was lower with invasive strategy compared to the conservative strategy. And of course, the use of anti-anginal medications was high in patients with conservative strategy compared with invasive strategy. And the use of dual anti therapy after PCI was more in patients with invasive strategy compared with conservative strategy. 96% of patients randomized to the invasive strategy were subjected to cardiac catheterization while 28% of the conservative strategy randomized, shifted, or crossed over to cardiac catheterization. Why? Because suspected or confirmed acute event in 14%, optimal medical treatment failure in 3.9%, or non-adherence to the medications in 8.1%. What about revascularization? Revascularization was performed in 80% of patients randomized to the invasive strategy and in 23% of patients randomized to the conservative strategy. Why 20% were not randomized to revascularization? Because two-thirds of patients had insignificant disease in coronary angiography, and one-third of patients had an extensive disease unsuitable for any mode of revascularization. For patients randomized to PCI, which was in 74%, Successful stents placed in 93%, drug eluting stents in 98%, while bypass surgery was done in 26%, and the use of arterial grafts in 93% and Lima in, 20, in 92%. What about the primary endpoint? Comparing the invasive versus conservative components of cardiovascular death, MI, hospitalization for unstable angina, hospitalization for heart failure, resuscitated cardiac arrest. Interestingly, the B-value was 0.34. The curves, two curves are superimposed and started to separate at two years. The hazard ratio was 0.93. But interestingly, at six months, there was 2% absolute harm for the invasive strategy compared with the conservative strategy. Why? Because the increased risk of periprocedural MI. But on the other hand, after four years, the invasive strategy was better, and 2% increased risk of four spontaneous MI in patients randomized to conservative strategy. So the invasive strategy was harmful earlier, after six months, but more favorable, more beneficial on the long term after four years due to lower incidence of spontaneous MI with the invasive strategy. The major secondary endpoints, cardiovascular death and MI, the same. The hazard ratio 0.9, p-value not significant, two curves are superimposed, 2% absolute hazard for the uh, invasive strategy earlier at six months, and after four years, 2% uh, absolute uh, uh, more risk for conservative strategy due to increased spontaneous MI. The net clinical benefit adding stroke for these components, the B value was 0.5. And what about all cause mortality or cause death? The probability of at least 10% relative risk reduction of invasive strategy on all cause mortality was low based on pre specified Bayesian analysis. So, the invasive strategy had no favorable impact on all cause death after four years. Procedure MI, more for the invasive strategy, lower for conservative strategy. Spontaneous MI was more with conservative strategy compared with the invasive strategy. Hospitalization for unstable angina was more and significant for patients randomized for the conservative strategy, and hospitalization for heart failure was more in patients uh, randomized to the invasive strategy. And there was no difference uh, regarding resuscitated cardiac arrest and stroke. And interestingly, this is uh, subgroup analysis. There was no heterogeneity of treatment effects. 
according to the presence or absence of ischemia by the core lab definition, the presence or absence of diabetes, high degree of baseline medical treatment, coronary artery disease severity, one vessel, two vessel, three vessel disease, proximal LED, or the degree of the baseline ischemia interpretation by the core lab, mild ischemia, moderate ischemia, or severe ischemia, there was no difference. So there was no heterogeneity of treatment effect based on any characteristic, including age, gender, ethnicity, race, uh, uh, stress test imaging, stress imaging modality, moderate or severe anterior ischemia, prior MI, prior cardiac death, PCI, cabbage, or ejection fraction. What about quality of life? Quality of life is a very important outcome for patients uh, treated. So uh, patients with stable coronary artery disease and moderate to severe ischemia had significant durable improvements in angina control and quality of life with an invasive strategy if they had angina daily, weekly, or monthly. But on the other hand, in patients without angina, an invasive strategy led to minimal symptom or quality of life uh, benefits as compared with a conservative strategy. So in patients with angina, sure decision making should occur to align treatment with patients' goals and uh, preferences. The limitations of this study, unplanned, no sham procedure, Based on exclusion criteria, the trial results don't apply to patients with acute coronary syndrome within two months, highly symptomatic patients, left main stenosis, ejection fraction less than 35%. The trial findings may not be generalizable to centers with higher procedural complication rates. Completeness of revascularization has not yet been assessed, and women who are enrolled in the trial but more often excluded from randomization, 23% only. Why? Because less ischemia burden and more non-obstructive coronary artery disease. So the summary of this trial, comparing invasive strategy with conservative strategy in patients with, with moderate to severe ischemia, stable coronary artery disease. The curves cross for the primary endpoint and the major secondary endpoints at approximately two years from randomization. There was two in 100 higher estimated rate with invasive strategy at six months. Two in 100 lower estimated rate with invasive strategy at four years. Procedure MI were increased with invasive strategy. Spontaneous MIs were reduced with invasive strategy. Low or cause mortality in both groups despite high risk clinical characteristics, high risk ischemia, and extensive CED. No heterogeneity of treatment effect, including by type of stress test, severity of ischemia, or extent of coronary artery disease. Very low rates of procedure-related stroke and death. So the conclusion of this study, ischemia is the largest trial of an invasive versus conservative strategy for patients with stable ischemic heart disease. Overall, an initial invasive strategy as compared with an initial conservative strategy, did not demonstrate a reduced risk over a median of 3.3 years, either for primary endpoint or major secondary endpoints. As will add, the probability of at least 10% benefit of invasive strategy in all cause mortality was less than 10%. So shared decision is very important in management of patients with a stable coronary artery disease. This is the interpretation of ischemia trial. If we look for the conservative strategy, no increased risk of clinical events, well-controlled angina, delayed invasive strategy possible, avoided in two-thirds of patients, but late hazards, spontaneous MI, while on the other hand, invasive strategy, no decreased risk of clinical events, and no mortality benefit. Less angina, predictable, quality of life improved, but early hazards due to increased risk of procedure MI. A lot of uh, interpretations, uh, criticism, uh, debates in social media for ischemia trials. Ischemia trial finds no evidence of low cardiac events in patients treated with heart procedures.
Stents and bypass surgery are no more effective than drugs for stable heart disease, highly anticipated trial results show. Study finds limited benefits of stent use for millions with heart disease. We have to take these uh, statements very cautiously because revascularization is still indicated in patients with stable angina and patients, of course, who are excluded from inclusion left main patients or patients who have an indication for revascularization. We are proud to be part of this study and I'd like to congratulate and thank my team at the cardiology department at Cairo University, Dr. Ahmad Talat, Dr. Ahmad Adil, Dr. Samah al Affas, Dr. Hussam Mahrous, Dr. Ahmad Kamal, Dr. Heba Deeb. Uh, they did a great job, excellent performance for the study and we have been acknowledged by the principal investigators of the ischemia trial that we have been included among the countries which were included 37 countries worldwide. And this is the first Egyptian patients randomized in ischemia trial. This was uh, uh, 2015. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you.